Imagine radio news existed during the Great Famine. What would it sound like if you could go into an archive or a museum and listen to news bulletins recorded in 1847? Well, this might give you some sense. BBC Radio Merseyside News on April the 19th, 1847. I'm Adrian Whitfield. Liverpool's magistrate, Edward Rushton, has today admitted... That In today's episode, I'm delighted to share with you a series of incredible recordings created by BBC Merseyside in 1997 to mark the 150th anniversary of The Great Hunger. Working with historians, they produced a series of news bulletins reporting the history as if their journalists were live on the scene in Liverpool as Irish famine emigrants arrived in the city. Now, these are really incredible historical resources, but I want to explain a little bit about how I came across them. Last October, I met Mick Ord at the Liverpool Irish Festival. Now, Mick used to work as the managing editor of BBC Merseyside in Liverpool. And as we were chatting, he mentioned how he had recently found an old tape of these news bulletins they had created back in 1997 to mark the 150th anniversary of The Great Hunger. A few days later, Mick shared these recordings with me and I was really blown away by them. I've spent years researching The Great Hunger and it's somewhat inevitable that at this stage after reading hundreds if not thousands of stories of hardship and suffering I've become a little desensitised. However, when I listened to these news bulletins it really had an impact on me. As you'll hear in this show it's hard not to be moved by these recordings. The format, most of them are in the form of news bulletins as I say give you a sense of immediacy, unlike reading a history book. Before we continue, a quick introduction to myself. My name is Finn DeWire and this is the Irish History Podcast. Now apologies for the delay in releasing this episode. You might be able to hear it in my voice, but I actually have COVID at the moment and it's proving hard to get over. This has completely thrown my schedule off, so there's going to be no show again next week. Sorry about that, but I am catching up. So I'm currently working on the final three episodes in the War of Independence series. Now back to today's show. I want to thank Mick Ord for sharing the recordings with me and BBC Merseyside for permission to use them. And to start the episode proper, there was no one better to talk to about this than Pauline McAdam, a journalist at BBC Merseyside. Pauline was centrally involved in creating these recordings and she now explains the bulletins and what you're about to hear. My name is Pauline McAdam and I have worked for many years at BBC Radio Merseyside, the local radio station in Liverpool. And part of my job has been documentary making. So, um, and quite a lot relating to local history. It's something that really resonates and is very popular with our listeners. So I've covered stories about the May Blitz, um, the, we're currently doing quite a lot of work on Hillsborough, more modern history, but always going into our archive and finding the stories as they happened. So way back in 1997, we, were, um, we took part in a project where we wanted to mark the, it was the 150th anniversary then of what was known as Black 47 in 1847, the kind of key year, particularly for Liverpool over that period of the famine years when thousands of people came into the city and essentially overwhelmed it and overwhelmed the the health provision such as it was. So what we did was we worked with people like Greg Query and Ian McKean of the Great Hunger Commemoration Committee for the city at the time and with an academic called Frank Neal from the University of Salford who has written a book called Black 47 and we took a lot of their work and a lot of the archive that they introduced us to and source materials like the local papers at the time, um, the the workhouse records, the letters to and from priests to create a picture of what the famine would have looked like if you lived in Liverpool then. So we took this notion, imagine if we were broadcasting then and over the course of a week, we created a series of famine bulletins marking what was going on over that year and how, you know, had there been a local radio station that you could have tuned into that would have told you what was going on. That's what we did. So we created news reports, bulletins, 
uh, interviews with reporters and we would take individual stories and create the news story that they were then, now. And interlaced with that was a sort of narrative to explain to people the context of what they were hearing. So one example would, would be there was a there were these things known as coffin ships where you would get you would get on your boat in Ireland and you'd be you'd come over and sometimes they'd give you some money to get to get rid of you to make you you know Liverpool's problem. I'm sure this is all sounding very familiar with the stories of refugees and borders today. Um, but quite often those people, if they made it, there was a whole hell waiting for them. But quite often they died on the ships, and there was a story of one that crashed over the other side of the Mersey from Liverpool at the time. And the ship crashed and, and, you know, quite a lot of people died. And so that was an example. You know, we told the story of the ships through a report as if we'd sent our radio car over to the Wirral to cover this disaster. And so over the course of that week, you heard the famine Irish story as it pertained to Liverpool in these bulletins. And then around that, we would have interviews and conversations with people to give us wider context or to talk about how 150 years on the city was still shaped by that event and those people you know there's a lot of people with the surname muck in liverpool and there's no it's no secret why um myself included so that was sort of what we did that was what you hear in those bulletins now to the recordings themselves I didn't want to interrupt them, so what you're about to hear is a mixture of the bulletins interspersed with reports from contemporary newspapers and some historical context provided by Greg Query, the Liverpool-based historian. Pauline McAdam will join me again at the end of the show to explain how they were received in 1997. She's a really wonderful story about one listener's connections to these events back in the 1840s. Listening to BBC Radio Merseyside on January the 8th, 1847. I'm Adrian Whitfield. Fears about the situation in Ireland are increasing, and Liverpool is being inundated with so called famine Irish fleeing starvation at home. The town already has a sizable Irish community, but the housing conditions have been criticised as inhumane, and the increasing population of mainly poor immigrants is being described as a public health disaster waiting to happen. I'm joined in the studio by Dr. William Duncan, who's Britain's first ever medical officer of health, whose recent appointment comes as a result of the Liverpool Sanitation. Act. That became law at the beginning of the year. Dr. Duncan, we live in what's described as the unhealthiest town in the empire. How on earth are we going to provide for the Irish? Parts of this town are a nightmare. The lodging houses and slum courts are the worst, and that's where the Irish go. Some of them are only staying for a night or two before moving on, but they're still crowding into cellars along with the poorest of the poor. The rooms in the lodging houses are just filled with beds, and they're cramming people into them more than one a bed but the cellars are even worse. It's just a case of bare earth or maybe filthy straw, and for a penny a night, people are being packed in, 30 or more at a time in tiny rooms. Well, they can't be called rooms. So they lie there, breathing in the stench, and if any of them are ill, well, we could be on the verge of an epidemic. But these slums have already been condemned for clearance. Yes, but that's not practical. There's nowhere else for them to go. A man was found dead in Marybone the other night of starvation. You carried reports in your bulletins yesterday of an Irish woman collapsing outside Waterloo Hotel. She had two babies with her. And this is happening all over town. These places are breeding fever, and soon it won't be just confined to the lower districts. What will happen when the doctors, relief officers, the priests get infected? We'll start losing respectable and useful citizens too. Liverpool could become a city of the plague. The Irish continue to pour into Liverpool through the Clarence Dock. Most are destitute and are reported to have walked from Mayo and other western counties as far as Dublin and Drogheda before crossing the sea as deck passengers. Officials of the Select Vestry, the body in charge of the poor relief, have today accused Irish landlords and steamship owners of paying Irish paupers passage as far as Liverpool. The town's poor relief officials are accusing the Irish authorities of shipping their problem here and forcing the Liverpool ratepayers to foot the bill for the feeding of the starving Irish peasant. There's been widespread criticism of the practice of allowing the poorest on board free of charge. Conditions on deck crossing the Irish Sea are proving hazardous 
and several deaths have been reported. BBC Radio Merseyside News, this is Adrian Whitfield. At least 23 people have died in a collision between two ships on the River Mersey. The cargo ship Sea Nymph collided with a passenger ship coming from Sligo, just off the magazine at New Brighton. The dead were all passengers on the Irish ship and include several children. Our reporter Fergal Parkinson is at New Brighton and joins us now. Well, yes, the ships collided late last night just off the coast here. Uh, residents of uh, New Brighton had two loud bangs and it's thought that the Sea Nymph, which was, as you say, a cargo vessel, caught the other ship, the Rambler, on the starboard bow. Now, the hull was breached and 13 people died as rigging on the ship collapsed, crushing them. It uh, seems that some people panicked and tried to launch a lifeboat, but that capsized and so far 10 bodies have been recovered. What do we know about the dead? Well, not a great deal. They seem to have been mostly very poor, according to the lifeboat crew, who have been involved in removing the rest of the 200 passengers from the Rambler. The problem is that they were all deck passengers. That is, they would have paid just to stay on deck during the crossing from Ireland, and not would have been, uh, and they wouldn't have been in cabins when the crash happened. Also, the ship was full of people coming into Liverpool because they can't afford to feed themselves in Ireland. Many of them are destitute, and it's thought that some of the dead may not be identified if they were travelling alone. We've heard that there are children amongst the dead and wounded. Do we know any more about how they died? Yes, that's right. Thirteen of the bodies so far recovered are of people who were crushed when the ship was damaged. Now, six children between about three and eight years have also died, and a young woman and a baby too. Now, many of the injured have been taken in by New Brighton residents, and some passengers have also been taken to the magazine public house near where the Rambler has run aground. Now, others have been taken to the Northern Hospital, and some of the injured are thought to be critical, but have been told that we won't know how many have drowned for several days. Lifeboat Captain Thomas Evans has said that more bodies may well be washed ashore over the next week. And what about the other ship involved, the Sea Nymph? Well, there were no casualties at all on board. Apparently, she had watertight compartments, which the Rambler didn't. And the Rambler is owned by the Glasgow and Londonderry Steam Packet Company. And no doubt this will raise the question once again of over overcrowding of deck passengers from Irish ports. There's already been concern that the steamship companies are taking advantage of the emigrants. And some reports the deck passage is being given free of charge in Irish ports. And that is to encourage the poorest Irish to leave. By the mid-1800s, Ireland's always turbulent relationship with England was to take on a fatal new twist. The colonisation of Ireland over hundreds of years had resulted in a country of large estates owned by landlords, predominantly of English origin, who often lived elsewhere. Their land was divided into tenant farms of varying sizes. Many were tiny plots which had to support large families mainly on a single crop, the potato. The mild climate made it easy to grow, and the potato, rich in vitamin C, along with milk, became the staple food for these tenant farmers. Other crops were grown, but these would then be used to pay rents. It was a risky way to live, and for those on the smallest plots of land, hunger was never far away. There had been partial crop failures before, and reliance on a single produce meant starvation. But in 1845, a strange new blight was seen on the potato. By 1846, it had caused a total crop failure. Subsequent crops failed either partially or totally, and the people starved in their tens of thousands. Although Ireland had become part of the United Kingdom in the Act of Union, of 1801, the government wouldn't intervene. Fear of disrupting market forces was used to justify this policy. It was left to the local landlords and parishes to raise the money for the relief operation. For many landlords, it was easier to throw the tenants off the land. They couldn't pay the rents. Enforced evictions followed and they died. Other landlords paid for their tenants' passage to England or America and beyond. 
Again, in the awful conditions at sea, many died. Ireland today is the only European country with a population lower than it was in the 1840s. More than a million Irish people emigrated in the famine years, and over a million more starved to death. BBC Radio Merseyside News on April the 19th, 1847. I'm Adrian Whitfield. Liverpool's magistrate, Edward Rushton, has today admitted that the 250 Irish who've just disembarked from the Rochester are destitute and the town's ratepayer will have to pay £6 a head to send them to America. Mr Rushton has criticised the mayor of Wexford for sending them here. The Rochester was originally bound for America but ran aground several weeks ago off Wexford. Although no lives were lost, Wexford... Oxford's mayor has been attacked by Mr Rushton for failing to do more than increase the burden on the Liverpool ratepayer. A coroner's inquest into the death of Mary McGanny of Vauxhall Road continued today. Mrs McGanny was found dead in bed in the cellar of a Vauxhall lodging house on Tuesday. Neighbours claimed that all she had to eat in the last week of her life was a single cup of tea. The inquest into the death of Patrick Curran has been hearing evidence from surgeon Richard Hobson. Patrick died on the 7th of January, but his family are thought to have arrived in Liverpool on Christmas Eve last year. The boy's father, Dennis Curran, has already given evidence that his wife and remaining five children have been living in Ashby Street without claiming poor relief. On the day Patrick died, the entire family of eight had only three pounds of red left. Old Mary Brady is the latest victim of Lace Street, now reported to be the unhealthiest street in Liverpool. The coroner brought in a verdict of death by starvation and has praised the parish overseers for saving the lives of the rest of the family. Radio Merseyside News on the 11th of May 1847. The borough coroner has called for relief work to be stepped up following the death by starvation of eight-year-old Luke Brothers. An inquest has been told that a post-mortem showed no trace of food anywhere in the child's system and that he'd starved to death in his bed in the family's Bannister Street cellar. I'm joined now by Sally Nugent, who's been following the case. Sally, with relief systems now in place and Liverpool supposedly divided into districts with officers to make sure no one slips through the net, how can this happen? The relieving officer for the area, Joseph Blevin, told the court that although the family of Luke Brothers was on the record as having received assistance, he hadn't visited them because they hadn't applied for more help. He added that he's been working seven days a week and it's impossible to visit all those at risk. Well, what were conditions like in the house? Frankly, awful. As you know, the cellars are repeatedly condemned, but this one seems to have been particularly bad. In fact, the coroner took the unusual step of insisting that the jury visit it and has also raised the matter with the mayor. Apparently, the Brothers family had received three shillings poor relief, but had all then contracted typhus and were only able to leave the house to beg when they felt well enough. As you say, the post-mortem revealed that Luke Brothers was otherwise healthy but had simply starved to death, and when the body was discovered it was lying on a mud floor with five others, all suffering from typhus. In fact, the coroner said that the house wasn't fit to accommodate pigs, and the family would have been better off sleeping on the dockside under a sailcloth. One juror said he hadn't believed such a place could exist in Liverpool until he saw it for himself. And did the authorities have no idea that these conditions existed? Well, the only people who really see the conditions are the medical officers, the poor relief officials, and of course the priests and clergy who go to attend to the dying. So the level of the poverty has been underestimated in official circles. But the coroner has specifically requested that the media report on the Luke Brothers case to highlight this very issue. He's criticised members of the select vestry for not visiting the slums themselves and has called for as many officers as are needed to prevent families like the Brothers from being left to starve. Otherwise, he said, we could see Liverpool turn into a city like London at the time of the plague. Sally, thanks a lot. Other news now. Faced with starvation at home and a law which only gave poor relief in the workhouse, thousands of Irish headed for England. Here, there was a legal obligation on the authorities not to let a person starve, and the meagre soup rations and money for housing were luxury compared to the death sentence in Ireland. Many came through Liverpool on their way to America and Australia, or inland to work in the mill towns. But the town already had a large Irish community of nearly 50,000 at the beginning of the 1840s, 
17% of Liverpool's population. By 1851, there were more than 83,000 Irish here, 22% of the population, almost as many as in, for example, the city of Cork. The people of Liverpool had to feed destitute Irish on a huge scale. Again, as in Ireland, the government refused to offer assistance from central funds. The relief work was funded locally and the rates were doubled. It was already an unhealthy town, a fast-growing port with huge slum areas and a sizable number of its own poor. The slum sellers of Vauxhall and lodging houses near the docks held their own terrors. Overcrowded, filthy and condemned for demolition, they now housed refugee Irish in their thousands. And typhus. Liverpool Mercury, 4th of May, 1847. Here we see on our piers thousands of pitiable creatures who have no choice but to get into cellars long since condemned as unfit for habitation. Diseases at work there, and when fever has marked its own, we remove the victims to temporary fever sheds for relief or death. Our police officers cannot drive them out because there are no hospitals or prisons to hold a tenth of them. Their begging in the streets and the disgusting exhibition they make with their squalid perishing children in their arms cannot be suppressed. Dear father and mother, I take this opportunity of letting you know that I am in good health, hoping that this will find you and our friends the same. I wrote you shortly after I came here, but received no answer, which makes me very uneasy until I hear from you. The Irish I know have suffered much. There are thousands of them buried here, and those who could not go to the States or in the poorhouse or begging through the streets. If you would wish to come here, I would like you with me, as I think times will mend. And dear father, I will send you some help soon. No more at present, but I remain your affectionate daughter till death, Catherine Hennigan. Reports of wide-scale fraud in the claiming of poor relief appear to have been substantiated this week. The Assistant Poor Law Commissioner for the North West, Albert Austin, has been investigating the huge rise in the numbers of people claiming food coupons and money from the relief officers in Fenwick Street. In January alone, the numbers rose from a little under 3,500 cases at the beginning of the month to more than 14,000 by the end. But Mr Austin says that although more Irish paupers are coming off the steamers at Clarence Stock every day, the figures simply don't add up. He joins me now. Mr Austin, what's going on? The Liverpool authorities have been very sensible in dealing with this terrible situation. At least they had the sense to keep count of the paupers coming ashore. And I've looked at the figures. The number of children actually coming through the port and those claiming relief are completely out of proportion. People are borrowing each other's children and claiming twice for them. How can you tell what the real picture is when people are just crowding outside the relief offices every day? Well, that's been the problem. The system works well under normal circumstances, but obviously we're dealing with a relief effort on an unprecedented scale, and it's wide open to abuse. There are duplicate claims, Irish people waiting to head off for America and Australia are claiming food, and even some English people pretending to be Irish. The select vestry is the body responsible for administration of poor relief. What are they going to do as a result of your findings? Well, I have recommended that instead of the poor coming to Fenwick Street for aid, we are going to divide the areas where most Irish live into 13 districts. Each will have its own relief office, and there will be at least one or possibly two new officers appointed in each district, and inspectors for the north and south of the city. So you will, in effect, be taking the aid to the people where they live? rather than this ludicrous crush every day. Yes, and that gives us the added benefit of assessing the housing conditions. As you know, many of the slum courts in Vauxhall, Scotland Road and so on were condemned years before this all began. Some people are dying because we simply don't know they're ill. This way, the officers will have a good idea of the community that they cover and that should help us to get aid to those who really need it. 
how much is all this going to cost? And will Liverpool's ratepayers be able to take much more? Well, the extra manpower should be covered by moving some of the police force onto special duties. And obviously, if we can cut down on fraud, then there will be an automatic saving. BBC News at 11 o'clock. The recent reorganisation of relief distribution is being hailed as a huge success in cutting fraudulent claims. Yesterday, the relief officers reported soup and bread distribution to 22,348 people, of whom more than 15,000 were children. Today, with the division into districts and the new relief officers opened, just under 5,000 people have been seen, a drop of 82%. It's thought that many may have been reluctant to come forward for poor relief because the new and easier identification of claimants makes Irish immigrants vulnerable to deportation if they can't prove residency in the parish of Liverpool for more than five years. Relief officers are warning that the number of people claiming charitable aid will continue to rise as more and more genuine destitute arrive on steamers from Ireland. Radio Merseyside News on March the 26th, 1847. I'm Adrian Whitfield. Liverpool magistrate Edward Rushton has today denounced the vagrancy law as completely unworkable here in Liverpool because of the numbers of Irish beggars on the streets. He says that the sheer numbers involved are threatening to overwhelm the local prison in Kirkdale. Sally Nugent reports. In a case brought before the magistrate's court today, an Irish woman who can't be named for legal reasons was charged with vagrancy and using her six children to beg for her. Mr Rushton had ordered her to be taken immediately to prison, but poor law official Mr Evans objected that the ratepayer would then be obliged to house her children in the workhouse and cover the cost of nursing care since two children are just babies. It's also claimed that the prison at Kirkdale can't cope with the numbers of vagrants and that it's not a deterrent because they see jail as a means of receiving warm housing and food. Mr Rushton is appealing for the Vagrancy Act to be reformed because he says it's now unenforceable here in Liverpool. Liverpool continued to do its best in a worsening crisis as it was overwhelmed by so-called famine Irish, still without help from central government. There was no obligation to provide for any but the poor of its own parish, but anyone who could prove residency of five years or more was entitled to help. The workhouse took only the very old, young or sick, and most people opted for outdoor relief, some food clothing of necessary, and a few pence for lodgings. The citizens petitioned government for a change in the law so that the same level of relief would be available in Ireland, hoping to discourage people from leaving there in the first place. They were also angry at reports that Irish landlords and parishes were giving people money to travel to Liverpool rather than feed them themselves. The law was changed to allow easy deportation of illegal Irish. Any who couldn't support themselves and couldn't prove residency could be escorted to the docks without a summons and put aboard ship for Ireland. In reality, many of those deported would have taken advantage of the dangerous deck passage straight back to Liverpool from Dublin or Drogheda. Liverpool Albion, July 1847. Two items of intelligence we are rejoiced to be in a position to communicate to our readers today. The first is that all the abominable holes called cellars, which have been generating fever amongst the lower and middle classes to an alarming extent, are in the process of being cleared and rendered uninhabitable for the future. And the second is that Irish paupers are being conveyed to their own country in their hundreds and will be returned in the thousands to their own shores in the coming weeks. Most of the cellars are situated in Lace Street, Midgehall Street and that lower part of town. It appears that fever has been and still is raging there, and not confining itself to the wretched occupants of the ground floor, it has spread its ravages to the rooms above and is rapidly consigning its victims to the grave.
BBC Radio Merseyside News on the 5th of April 1847. Residents on Brownlow Hill are opposing plans to build three new fever sheds. A select vestry, the body responsible for poor relief in Liverpool, has approved the proposals as the number of typhus cases continues to increase. Medical officers say the bed shortage is now acute. Richard Turner reports. The fever sheds are to be built next to the existing workhouse hospital on Brownlow Hill at a cost of £2,100 each. 300 new beds will be made available, but local residents of Abercrombie Ward are complaining that the move will put them at greater risk of contracting typhus. The owners of the lodging houses on Mount Pleasant say they'll lose business as a result of the new hospital. There are also complaints that crowds of people are gathering in Mount Pleasant each day to watch the dead being removed to the pauper cemetery in Cambridge Street. Dr William Duncan, Liverpool's Medical Officer for Health, says the fear of catching typhus is unfounded. He says there's always been a hospital on the site and that an increase in the number of patients won't mean an increase in the risk to the local community. But the problems of crowds watching the removal of bodies is to be addressed and members of the select vestry are to look at other ways of dealing with the problem. BBC Radio Merseyside News on the 10th of May 1847. Two floating hospitals have just arrived in the River Mersey to provide more beds for the increasing number of typhus cases breaking out in the city. The workhouse hospital on Brownlow Hill and the fever sheds are already full to capacity and the Home Secretary has finally bowed to pressure from Liverpool's ratepayers by providing the hospital ships. Our reporter Paul Grant is at the dockside and joins us now. Thanks, Adrian. Along with a large number of ships coming in and out of the port, the two fever ships, or lazarettos, are now anchored here in the Mersey. The Akbar and the Newcastle have been provided for, as you say, by central government, but the cost of fitting them out and manning them is being met by the local ratepayer. Two more ships, the Druid and the Lancaster, have been promised, but the biggest problem is in slowing down the number of immigrants already infected with typhus. Liverpool's mayor has warned shipping companies that they will have to weigh anchor outside the port until their passengers are being checked by a medical officer. But whether this will slow down the so-called Irish fever remains to be seen. This is Paul Grant for BBC Radio Merseyside at Clarence Dock. News on the 27th of July, 1847, I'm Adrian Whitfield. The typhus epidemic continues to rage in the city. Current estimates are that 8,000 people are being treated for the so-called Irish fever, with the worst affected areas being the Irish quarters in Vauxhall, Scotland, Exchange and Great George. Extra fever sheds have been erected on Brownlow Hill, hospital ships are anchored on the Mersey and there have even been calls for Hilbury Island to be turned into a quarantine hospital. I'm joined in the studio now by the medical officer for health, Dr William Duncan. Dr Duncan, how bad is the situation? If I tell you that in January we recorded 44 fever deaths and now in July the total is 828. Does that answer your question? The workhouse hospital is full. There are new fever sheds in the grounds and the Lazaretto fever ships on the river. You can understand why people, for example, in Abercrombie are worried that these sheds are putting them at risk. Look, we're treating 8,000 people. We need beds for them and the people at Abercrombie are not at risk. The fever sheds are clean and you can't catch typhus by living nearby. It's the Irish living literally on top of each other in the slums who are at risk. 487 people have died in Lay Street alone. That's a third of the street. You have something like one in 200 chance of catching typhus if you live in Rodney Street. Yes, but it isn't just Irish paupers, is it? The Reverend John Johns, the Unitarian minister, has died and left a widow and six children. He contracted typhus in the slums where he worked among the poor. We've lost 10 doctors, 20 relieving officers and nurses... And the Catholic priests are dying too. But how many of the residents of Abercrombie are going into Vauxhall to help the poor? Well, they haven't got too much to worry about then. Chronic overcrowding 
in the slum courts and cellars was recognised as a cause of the spread of so-called Irish fever, typhus. But medical opinion of the day held that the disease was spread by breathing in the bad air. Victims were bathed and kept in well-ventilated fever hospitals, and some recovered, but by coincidence rather than design. Typhus is spread by body lice. The organism lives in the lice which move easily from person to person in overcrowded rooms. As people scratch, they risk passing the infection directly into the bloodstream. The awful poverty meant that the dead would often lie with the living for several days. The body lice would move quickly from a corpse to a warm host, taking typhus with them. And if the lice died and decomposed, the disease could still be spread through inhaling the particles in dust. The medical officers, nurses and clergy were at great risk because they too would contract the body lice as they moved amongst the infected. The Unitarian minister, John Johns, died leaving a wife and six children, and ten Catholic priests died after catching typhus administering the last rites to the dying Irish Catholics. Liverpool Journal, 13th of March, 1847. The Reverend Mr Nightingale has caught the fever, which has deprived society of a most kind-hearted and pious clergyman. Last week a whole family was down with fever. There was no nurse and no doctor. An infant died, and the mother was only able to push the dead child from off the straw on which she herself was dying. No one came to remove the corpse until the daily call of the Reverend Mr. Newsham of St. Anthony's Church. In another court, all the family were down with fever but for one child, and that child was burnt to death when its clothing caught fire whilst going for a hot drink. June 1847. I regret to inform you of the sickness and deaths of our Liverpool clergy. Five are dead, and Mr. Grayson of St. Patrick's is hardly expected to last another day. Fever is making fearful ravages all over town, but especially around St. Anthony's. We have prayers in every congregation. From Father Thomas Seed, St. Anthony's Church, Scotland Road, October 16th. You will have heard, no doubt, of my present destination. Little did I expect to find on arriving at Liverpool that this priest-killing town was to be the scene of my labours, but here I am, sent to the great town of Liverpool, dwelling in the midst of plenty and want, happiness and misery, life and death. Every Friday and Saturday evening we sit in the confessional, listening to the innocent tales of these good Liverpoolians. If anyone wants an idea of real misery, he only has to enter the dark, filthy cellars of the poor, dying Irish. In the present state of things, I cannot promise myself with any assurance a long life. Two years seems to me a very long time to live in these perilous times. St. Patrick's Church, Park Place. In memory of the Liverpool priests who, in attending the sick, caught typhus and fever and died in 1847. The Reverend Peter Nightingale of St. Anthony's died on the 2nd of March, 1847, aged 32. Tim Heston of St. Patrick's died on the 16th of June, aged 33 years. James Hagger of St. Patrick's died on the 23rd of June, aged 29. William Vincent Dale of St. Mary's died on the 26th of June, aged 48. Robert Gillow of St. Nicholas died the 22nd of August, aged 35. And John Fielding Whitaker of St. Joseph's died on the 18th of September, aged 36 years.
Radio Merseyside News on Wednesday, May the 12th, 1847. A public meeting of local ratepayers is taking place now at the Sessions House in Chapel Street. The meeting's been called to discuss the problems posed by the Irish paupers and the rising cost of poor relief. We can join our reporter Shari Val live from the Sessions House now. Thanks, Adrian. The meeting's concerned with the cost of the Irish poor relief, and there are suggestions that the parish should petition central government for financial help. The mayor, Mr Lawrence, is chairing the meeting, and he's expressed concern that the very fact it's taking place might cause panic. And he's also said there's no doubt as to everyone knowing their duty in caring for the poor, but that the Irish landlords should be taking responsibility for the care of the Irish poor, rather than, as he put it, the hard-working people of England. Now, that comment met with huge applause, as you can imagine, as did his criticism of the mayor of Wexford for paying the fares of the poor Irish to Liverpool. Now, we're waiting for the town's magistrate, Edward Rushton, to speak. And you may recall that he's said that the Vagrancy Act is unenforceable here in Liverpool because of the sheer number of Irish beggars and their families in the streets. Now, he's standing to speak about now. You are all aware of the problems that we've had in dealing with vagrancy in the port of Liverpool in recent months. I asked port officials to keep records of the number of Irish coming ashore on January the 13th. And since that time, we've kept records as accurately as possible under the circumstances. Since January the 13th last year, 156,338 destitute Irish have put ashore. We're unable to clear the slum courts, which are already condemned, because this is where these poorest of the poor are now living. The influx of Irish has beaten the law there too. Sir James Graham has said that I've suspended that Act of Parliament. I have not. It's entirely inoperable here. And these wretched houses, instead of them being filled with one family, are filled to suffocation, very often with the dead and the dying. It was in these places that Catholic priests went down to their death. It was in these places that our brave overseers caught fever. And it was in these places that fatal disease was generated and threatened to strike down our honest citizens all over town. The working men of this town have borne this calamity, not only without a murmur, but with charity and courage. Our object is to persuade government to pass a bill for proper poor relief in Ireland, and then to pass a bill enabling us to send the Irish home. But we must also urge the authorities to help us, so that until those bills are passed, we can at least sustain these poor creatures as Christian men. The famine continued in Ireland into the 1850s, and Irish people continued to leave. Liverpool had seen Irish pass through its port since the cheap fares, which came with the steamships. But the famine created a new Ireland, and a new Liverpool. The Irish settled here in huge numbers. They represented almost a quarter of the town's population by 1851. Eventually, they moved out of the slums, and Irish quarters. The Catholic Church, keen to reassert itself in England, took advantage of its large congregations and educated the children in Catholic schools. Liverpool, like Glasgow and other cities where the Irish settled, saw periods of sectarian violence, fueled partly by the competition for casual labour which the Irish represented. The Irish and their descendants also made a positive contribution to the life of the city, not only in manual occupations, but also in professions such as medicine, nursing and teaching. The famine years had been hard on Liverpool. The local taxpayer bore the brunt of the relief operation. 
The town suffered a typhus outbreak and a few years later cholera appeared. And there was a strong sense of the injustice that the local people had bailed out the Irish landlords with no help from their own government. Before I finish, I want to return to Pauline McAdam. When I interviewed Pauline, she explained to me how these news bulletins were released back on BBC Merseyside in 1997. And she has a wonderful story about when the granddaughter, yes, you heard that correct, a granddaughter of an Irish famine emigrant got in touch. But yeah, over the course of the week, we played, I mean, from memory, I think each bulletin is about, I don't know, between five and seven minutes long. And it was played in our mid-morning programme. And that was the show where we always had a phone in anyway. So the idea would be that when, when people had heard the bulletin, we would then maybe have a guest to explain a bit more of what you'd heard or to give you something up to date about the Irish diaspora, particularly in Liverpool. And then, of course, you would throw the phone lines open and we got amazing calls. You know, we got people talking about their family history. Um, there was a lovely lady called Amy Flowerdew, who was, who was quite elderly then. Um, and she phoned to say that her grandmother was a famine Irish child who had come to Liverpool. So she was listening to these bulletins and saying, well, actually, that is my grandmother. That is her life. That is her story. And this elderly lady, you know, 150 years on, just about bookended the, that family's story. So that was the idea as well. Um, it was always the idea at Merseyside, very much like Ireland. Radio in Liverpool isn't a one-way street. <laughs> you know, there's, there's a dialogue with our listeners. There always has been. There's a Liverpool phrase called gagging in, which is where you jump in on, an, on a conversation or, you know, or a chat with somebody. Or, you know, if you're in your pub and you say something at the next table, and that's what it is, it's gagging in. And that's what we did. They would come and just tell us their stories then. So these bulletins were partly to spark a conversation in the now. Thanks to Pauline for taking the time to talk to me, to McOrd for sharing the recordings in the first place and BBC Merseyside for permission to use them in this podcast. Until next time, Sloan. <laughs>